very early on in magic development, um, there was this proposal that developers be rewarded based on how many banned cards there were. <laughs> so, so we were talking about how to do bonuses, how to, how to get metrics based on various groups' performances. This is an important topic. And, and how do you measure how good a developer was and how good a designer was? And uh, I advocated that, that the answer was not that, that banned cards were bad, uh, that actually, uh, that if there were no banned cards, if there were no changes, then they weren't being adventurous enough. And that, uh, that the game was too complicated and too sort of broad to, like, like, if there weren't mistakes being made, they weren't taking their chances, and therefore the game was less good than it could be. And so I, I think making mistakes is a part of this project, and then fixing them later is another part. Banned cards are an inescapable part of card game history and culture. Designs are never perfect, the game is never fully balanced, and sometimes creators just want to shake things up. Different card games use the ban list as a tool to help fix issues with their designs after problems have already been released into the game. Card games, if they continue on for long enough periods of time, will eventually develop the need for a ban list. This video seeks to take key snapshots of major card games and their respective ban list philosophy. From the very beginning of Magic the Gathering, to Yu-Gi-Oh!'s modern day pseudo-rotation, to forgotten games like Force of Will, and the ban list that might have saved it. But before we can continue, here's a word from today's sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Paragon, a brand new trading card game inspired by the worlds of fantasy tabletop RPGs. In Paragon, you command an army of monsters led by a powerful creature called a Paragon, and fight for control of a 4x4 battlefield grid where strategic, positional gameplay is king. The game is designed to be fast-paced, intuitive, and easy to learn, but very difficult to master. Paragon is also planned to work as a tavern game that can be easily integrated into any fantasy tabletop RPG with special items, characters, and quests attached to the sets. The game is coming to Kickstarter this fall, but you can take action right now to receive three bonus booster packs when you pledge on the Kickstarter campaign. All you have to do is visit the promo page listed in the description below, enter your email, and pay $2 to reserve your bonus packs. Once you've done that, be sure to follow the Kickstarter pre-launch page to be notified when the campaign is live. I think the game looks incredibly interesting, so be sure to check it out below. Let's go back to the first TCG ban list ever, back in 1994, to the absolute beginning of a trading card games in general. At this point, Magic has already released Unlimited Edition and Arabian Nights. The competitive scene, which barely exists at the time, is rough to say the least. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of information about specific deck lists saved online about decks from this time, but I think I'll let the ban list and restrictions speak for themselves. Before trying a ban list, Magic the Gathering would implement the first ever 4 max copies per deck rule to stop problem strategies. Originally, this wasn't the case, and players could theoretically do things such as fill a deck with 20 copies of Black Lotus. Interestingly enough, the first set of Magic the Gathering wasn't designed with the secondary market, whales, or even extreme trading in mind. Garfield intended for cards to be rare enough to limit people's deck building options outright. Of course, with the game's runaway success, this wouldn't be the case, and change would need to be implemented. Magic the Gathering would implement a ban list limiting 21 specific cards, banning Sherazad specifically, as well as all anti-cards in general. Of course, this list contained the expected Magic heavy hitters, such as Black Lotus, the Moxes, and Time Walk. These are cards that allow a cheating of resources and a disruption of the natural back and forth flow of the game. But also on this ban list are dated payoffs like Orcus Oriflame, Ruck Egg, and Icy Manipulator. We do know that the first ever deck to win a Magic the Gathering tournament was a black red aggro deck using Orcish Oriflame to push for damage. But the actual reason the card was banned was due to different printings of the card having different casting costs, therefore creating confusion. These weaker cards on the ban list do, however, reflect the casual nature of very, very early Magic the Gathering. People played with what they had, or what they could obtain from the local people they knew. The metas Wizards of the Coast thought to ban were the metas they could see. This is why parts of the ban list are so odd to us today, especially with the added context of how modern 1994-1993 format events play. The last section of cards on this ban list is a more odd one. Shahrazad could create sub-games within the current game of Magic the Gathering. The reward for winning these games was minimal, 
especially compared to the time it would take to resolve matches played with this card. It would create complex game states, as multiple copies of the card could be used in decks, thus creating sub-games within sub-games. This was miserable for everyone involved, and thus was banned. Anti-cards are another similar case. Anti was a mechanic that required players to play for ownership of each other's cards during a game. Needless to say, players did not like losing their cards. It just wasn't intended for competitive play. Plus, it created potential legal issues in regards to gambling. Overall, in this first ban list, these cards can be roughly sorted into three categories. Fast staples, strategy-specific payoffs, and game-breakingly frustrating cards. As we go through other ban lists, we'll start to see a trend with these type of cards tending to be problems. Designers of card games often tend to make the same mistakes over and over again, constantly underestimating how far players will push the limits of their game. Magic the Gathering's first ban list is a reflection on this issue. It was a game designed with casual play first, and therefore it needed changes for competitive play. The first ban list was designed purely with the intention to fix issues with the game and improve the experience for players. Despite the potential financial risk of releasing a ban list to the game, the earliest creators of Magic the Gathering decided that gameplay was more important than cards holding value. Going forward, this first ban list of Magic, with its heavy use of limits as opposed to outright bans, would eventually become Magic's vintage format. Following Magic the Gathering, two other card games would release, the Pokemon TCG and Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG. Pokemon TCG would largely avoid ban list due to their tight standard rotation format. Yu-Gi-Oh!, however, would have a different story needing ban list almost right out of the gate. Yu-Gi-Oh!, at its inception, would be an incredibly anime-focused game, largely coinciding with the production and release of the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime. The game would see this anime attitude follow with several effects of the cards. This was a problem since Yu-Gi-Oh!, unlike other card games, lacks a resource system. Effects that wouldn't be remotely usable in other card games become absurdly powerful in a game system like Yu-Gi-Oh!, Yu-Gi-Oh!'s first ban list going into effect in July of 1999 wouldn't reflect this just yet, having only three cards limited, two being board wipes, and one solid trap disruption card. Of course, this is to be expected having less than 200 unique cards in the game at the time. The smaller card pool meant that any removal or disruption could prove game-winning in this caveman format. A little more than six months later, Konami would update the ban list to add in 12 new cards and slightly unrestricting trap hole. This ban list tells a much more interesting story. Limited first and foremost is Exodia in all of his pieces. Exodia in the anime is famous for automatically winning games if you can get all five Exodia cards into your hand. Combined with powerful draw spells and Yu-Gi-Oh's lack of a resource system, it would be extremely easy to draw into Exodia with almost no opponent interaction. Following this, the card's Pot of Greed and later Change of Heart would be limited and then later later banned. Also on the second ban list was the card Last Will, a card that could cheat in monsters from the deck and another board wipe Mirror Force. Yu-Gi-Oh!'s early ban list follow a similar trend to Magic's early ban list. Cards that are overtuned and not designed with competitive play, or really any constructive play in mind, leads to the necessary creation of a ban list. The cards also almost all fall into the Fast Staples category as discussed earlier. Yu-Gi-Oh!'s key difference is how much more restrictive card effects would need to be in order to ensure a balance. In Yu-Gi-Oh!, the resource that determines what plays you can make is how many cards are in your hand, unlike other card games with more defined resource systems. The Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG would have to be more proactive and vigilant for a wide variety of loops, infinite combos, and absurd locks, since these could often be accessed right out of the gate. As was the case with Magical Scientist, Delinquent Duo, and Tribe Infecting Virus early on in Yu-Gi-Oh!'s history. All cards that would have to be banned for how free and powerful they were. Now let's check back on Magic the Gathering's ban list in the 2000-2016 to 2016 era. Many years after the initial Magic ban list, Magic the Gathering had split into several different formats. Vintage, where most things can only be limited, and all cards are legal. Standard, a format rotating around newest set releases, and Modern, being a non-rotating halfway point between the older and newest formats. Here we see the first evolution or refining of the ban list philosophy. First, the list would develop into a standard consistent force. With every so often, players could expect to see an updated list. According to Wizards of the Coast at this time, cards should only be banned as an absolute last resort. Of course, this was to protect players and their investments in the decks, forcing more effort, time, and resources onto the design and testing divisions of Wizards of the Coast. 
This would lead to several cards throughout this period of Magic the Gathering going unbanned when they should have been banned. 2003 would see Mariah's Wake going unbanned for some formats where it absolutely dominated, and Collected Company and Rally the Ancestors in around 2015 to 2016. These cards would either rotate out of format, or slowly fall out of the meta and be replaced by other strategies and new adaptations to the format giving credibility to Wizards of the Coast reluctant ban strategy, letting the meta sit and develop at the cost of immediate change, perhaps for the better. Of course, this era would see plenty of Magic the Gathering classics banned as well. Birthing Pod, Faithless Looting, Jace the Mind Sculptor, and the Artifact Lands, just to name a few. But a healthy balance between time and cards banned would leave players being generally happy with how the list was handled during these years. But Magic the Gathering's scarce banless philosophy was unfortunately not viable for every card game. While Magic the Gathering had players who had been playing the game for years at this point, and with massive investments into the game, our next example did not. Force of Will TCG was a Magic the Gathering competitor that released and was extremely popular back in 2015. It had a color mana system similar to Magic's, and it's based around a ruler card like Commander Format Magic or One Piece Today. It's still going today, but on a much, much, much smaller scale. What caused its decline is a series of back-to-back -back bad formats combined with some extremely bad products and power creep. Right before the release of their second block, the Force bad format would come from the release of a new card type called Regalia, zero-cost cards that could equip to a ruler and give devastating effects. This would lead to a red aggro meta that would take around 90-95% of tournament results at the time. Force of Will Company, the company behind Force of Will, opted not to create a ban list for this format. The previous block of sets had sold absurdly well and even briefly rivaled Magic the Gathering sales. Plus, in the eyes of the creators, the game was casuals first. This bad format was followed up by another Tier 0 meta based around the Reflect Reflame Ruler, a ruler that could outvalue almost every other ruler in the game while having no real counters at the time. This obliterated any chance the format, and the game to an extent, could recover in the eyes of the player base. Player turnout would continuously decrease, as would sales. The meta wouldn't be dealt with until around six months later, where Force of Will would implement a ban list with just one card. The problematic ruler, Reflect Refrain. Following this, the company would be more reactive with the ban list, albeit it couldn't keep up with the absurd number of problematic cards created by the Force of Will design team. Perhaps if the game had reacted to its problematic metas quicker with a ban list, the game's initial decline could have been mitigated or even avoided. Much later in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, Yu-Gi-Oh would see a ban list to accommodate the separate OCG and TCG formats of the game. These two ban lists would see different philosophies to managing the ban list and the game as a whole. The OCG ban list would largely follow a similar pattern to the classic hit the most successful and popular strategy philosophy. What makes this interesting is how reliant it was on semi-limiting or lowering cards to two copies per deck. OCG Yu-Gi-Oh tends to opt to first decrease the consistency of certain strategies as opposed to outright banning them. On one hand, this prevents people from losing out on playing cards and decks they've bought. But on the other hand, this doesn't remotely solve problems created by toxic strategies, especially in a game as fast and as searchable as Yu-Gi-Oh. It also makes the game more luck-based and oftentimes more frustrating for all players involved such as the time the TCG semi-limited, then later limited, and then later later banned Max-C. It created a format where it would be sub-optimal to consistently play around this powerful card, but still just as devastating when it would resolve. For a better example, take a look at the Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel ban list, where cards are semi-limited en masse to avoid actually dealing with problem strategies and refunding player card points. Speaking of the TCG, we can look at another interesting trend in Yu-Gi-Oh!'s ban list, rotating the meta by forcibly banning cards. Yu-Gi-Oh! unlike Magic the Gathering and Pokemon, never had any sort of rotating format. Yu-Gi-Oh! would at several points ban all decks from a format in order to ensure that the competitive players would have to play the newest decks. An example of this is the November 2015 ban list, where Cleeforts, Shadals, Necroz, Burning Abyss, and Ritual Beast all received hits on the ban list. Players would have to look to upcoming meta decks such as Cosmos, the new Pendulum decks, and Monarchs for new options, until these strategies would later receive hits on the ban list as well. This of course also plays into Yu-Gi-Oh! having a much more involved ban list, restricting in some way 13 cards and unrestricting 4. It's not to say that these decks during this format didn't need to be hit on the ban list, as they would maintain a large amount of meta presence, but they also have the side effect of increasing new product sales for Konami. Going back to Magic the Gathering, after 2018, Magic the Gathering would see a shift in design philosophy 
following a mandate by Wizards of the Coast parent company Hasbro for Wizards of the Coast to make more money. There would be massively more product release, more explosive and mass appeal oriented card designs, as well as the later introduction of crossover sets. This shift in philosophy would be known as fire design. Fun, inviting, replayable, and exciting. Notice how balance is not on that list. Fire was created to make cards more appealing to a wider audience. Fire design increased the power level of commons, homogenized strategies around powerful cards, and repeatedly rotated the format of modern due to the increased power level of cards. There's a lot more to be said about fire design, but for this video, just know it contributed to a rise in power level and uniquely an increase in the text per card in Magic. This combined with more products in general spiked the amount of cards that would create problems for each format. From Oko Thief of Crowns, to Omnath Locus of the Royal, to Uro Titan of Nature's Wrath, new Tier 0 and Meta Warping cards would upset the player base and create extremely unpopular formats. To save face, Wizards of the Coast would ramp up bans and frequency, leading to an absurd amount of cards getting banned around this time. Even in an already rotating format, such as Standard, 2021 and 2022 would see an almost monthly ban list, respectively having 9 and 11 updates to various formats ban list. 2020 saw a whole rata of the companion mechanic on top of the year's bans. All this putting Magic the Gathering on par with Yu-Gi-Oh! in terms of the amount of cards banned, this time purely for how pushed the power level of cards was. The ban list had become a band-aid to bad game design. Bad game design meant to push the game to a wider audience. This coincides with Magic the Gathering's player outrage problems, with many long-established players exiting the game and even the company's stock price being affected. Magic would take corrective action in 2023, putting the ban list on a set clock and trying their hardest not to ban cards. This would be a moderate success, overshadowed by Wizards of the Coast, other actions around this time. For our last card game, it'll be one of the newest card games on the market, the One Piece TCG. The One Piece TCG would have its first ban list only three sets in, due to a format dominated by one color or brand of deck without any real competition. Bandai would release two separate lists for One Piece, both targeting red decks, and more specifically Whitebeard. Whitebeard's gimmick was losing yourself life to get absurd value. The deck could hit high numbers, recur blockers, and protect life to an extreme degree. These two ban lists hit three from Whitebeard and one from a different self-deck out turbo deck, all of these falling into strategy-specific payoffs. Even after the ban list, red would still be extremely powerful and would still be the color of the top three decks. But what can we learn from this new age list? In 2023, we've moved on from the era of Pot of Greed and Scheherazade type card designs. Cards are still power-wise just as broken, but 30 years of precedence has done quite a lot to reduce the obvious and absurd game designs of casual first games. Bandai has learned from previous card games and seeks to ban problematic cards in a relatively quick fashion not wanting competitive players to grow unhappy and leave the game. The ban list did miss key cards in the red strategies, showing the modern disconnect from major companies and the player base. But the company is taking action to fix their game in both the ban list and in future card designs. It's all still imperfect, but what card game isn't? So what conclusions can we draw from these examples? Ban lists are a vital tool for managing a card game's health. Without one, players can become dissatisfied at the state of the game and formats or just leave for greener pastures. However, ban lists can also go too far and destroy consumer confidence in buying product or investing in a deck. Ban list as a whole have moved from fixing casual first game design in the earliest years of card games to being a tool for optimizing game balance, to today being a tool used for companies to make more money. The companies that seek to maximize profits at any cost can use ban list as a tool to manage formats, forcing players to buy more product after losing access to their previous decks. It's also been used as a band-aid to fix problems created by flashy and marketing first game design. But the ban list still does a lot of good. It allows companies to more freely experiment with card designs. Without the early experimentation throughout each card game's history, most card games would never have their identities today. Imagine Yu-Gi-Oh without Dragon Rulers, or imagine Magic the Gathering without Birthing Pod or Jace the Mind Sculptor. Ban lists are a safety net for card design. While it's certainly not one that should be abused, Games that make use of a ban list are able to mechanically grow faster than those that don't. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. There should be a new tier list part coming up soon, although I I might just end up scrapping it. I recently saw a fellow YouTuber and streamer do the same gimmick on stream with not even a tenth of the effort and get more views than my current run of the series. I have to be realistic about things, and plus it kills me on the inside to see months worth of hard work get outperformed in a second. So we'll we'll see about that. 
I've also got some massive life stuff getting in the way. I've been looking for a job for quite a while now after sending out literal thousands of job applications, and I can't get one anywhere. So I'll be having to go back to school and get my master's. Oh, if y'all enjoyed the content, please uh, leave a like and subscribe. Share the video around. Uh, I'll see you guys next time.